Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Uh, this is a webinar where we talk about Lyme disease, and you create the webinar with your questions. I'm very interested to see what you all have in store for me tonight. Um, I it, Here at the beginning of the webinar, I'm still waiting for a lot of people to show up, but from what I can tell already, we have a number of uh, returning people, and uh, there are a number of new people as well, too. For those of you that have been here before, welcome back. I'm glad to see that you keep coming back and that you're getting some value out of this. And then uh, for those of you that are new, the way that you participate, there's a number of ways. Well, one, you can just listen in and see uh, what the questions are and how we respond to that. Um, but the second thing you can do is actually write questions to me too. And you can do that uh, by writing a question through the chat box that is over on the right-hand side of the screen on the lower uh, right-hand side. Now, keep in mind, when you write a question to me, short questions work best in this format, so I won't answer long questions. Um, and secondly, do not hit the enter key until the whole question is done. If you hit the enter key too, uh, during as you're writing the question, it actually sends multiple questions to me, and it gets to be really hard to piece those all together from this side of the screen, okay? Um, so we're scheduled for an hour and a half tonight. I plan on doing that unless some reason I just get all pooped out. Uh, keep in mind, this is at the end of my patient care day. And today, actually, it's at the end of doing the ILADS conference and a patient care day. So I actually was attending the International Lyme Associated Diseases Society uh, meeting uh, through the early part of the day and then uh, patient care this afternoon. So it, we'll, we'll see how that all goes. Okay. And let's see here. Oh, I am creating a recording. Um, tomorrow morning, you'll get an email uh, saying that, uh, notifying you that the recording is ready to be uh, viewed if you need to see it again. And that uh, email will also have links in it that will give you information on how to sign up for next week's webinar. Uh, tonight is the first of three webinars in a row, and then I'll take a week off after that. So we've got uh, three Thursdays in a row now of uh, conversations with Marty Ross, MD. All right. So without any further ado, let's see what you got in store for me tonight. Uh, let's see if I can get my computer to perform okay here. All right, hello, Brenda. Let's see, hello, Dr. Ross. Have you heard of using uh, ciproheptadine for neurolyme of Bartonella symptoms? What do you know about the side effects of ciproheptadine? Thanks. So um, ciprohepidine is a um, antihistamine medicine. Um, and so um, one of the, I, I haven't seen it used specifically for Bartonella symptoms, but I have seen it used for symptoms that occur in Bartonella and in Lyme. And specifically it can help with, um, a, a, well, a number of things. One, it can help with brain fog. Um, and by brain fog, I mean cognitive dysfunction, uh, difficulty thinking, difficulty processing information. Um, so that's one thing it can help with. And the other thing it can help with is to lower, uh, to block histamines if you're allergic to things and uh, those things in your environment are triggering allergies in you that can lead to histamine production. Also, when you have Lyme and you have Bartonella, some people develop a syndrome which is called mast cell activation syndrome. And in mast cell activation syndrome, there are these cells called mast cells. And you can kind of think of mast cells as the allergy cell in the body. So when we're allergic to something like a cat dander or pollens from the environment, they land on that mast cell and it causes the mast cell to make and release histamines, okay? but we now know, and this is a newer way of looking at things, that those mast cells can get turned on and overly turned on when you have chronic infection. And it now appears that mold toxicity, infections, and stress, all of those things can actually turn on your mast cells. It's not just the things we're allergic to, it's the infections turn them on, and toxins, and stress, turn on the mast cells so that they overproduce um, these uh, 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 histamines, and they release them very easily too. And so sometimes when people have chronic Lyme or they have mold toxicity syndrome, over time they actually start developing allergies and sensitivities to things that could suggest that maybe they have mast cell activation going on, okay? So in Lyme and in Bartonella, one of the symptoms you can have is cognitive dysfunction. And some of that, if you have allergies or if you are having mast cell activation, some of that brain fog may be due to excess histamines, right? And what the histamines do in the brain 
they trigger a type of immune cell in the brain called a microglia to overproduce cytokines. And cytokines are inflammation chemicals made by your immune system in response to Lyme. One of the side effects of those cytokines is they make it so you can't think, okay? So first of all, excess histamines cause more cytokines to be made. Secondly, there's a receptor, a type of histamine receptor in the brain called an H3 receptor, right? It's a type of histamine receptor in the brain. And, it, and, and if you have the right amount of histamines, it triggers the H3 receptor to cause the brain to work well. But if you have too many histamines, it triggers the H3 receptor to shut the brain down, basically, to kind of send the brain into hibernation, all right? So one of the things you want to do is you want to block those H3 receptors if you're making too many histamines. And so the ciproheptadine works as an antihistamine. It blocks histamines, okay? So what ciproheptadine could do if you have Lyme or Bartonella in, and your Lyme or Bartonella are triggering brain fog due to excess histamines caused by mast cell activation possibly, being on a ciproheptadine may help block those histamine receptors in the brain so that you have better thinking basically, okay? All right, in terms of side effects, any antihistamine that we take can either make us really dry in our nasal passages or sometimes can make us feel a little sleepy. Um, and the only way to know is to give that a try, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you. And then let me just show you, do a quick screen share here so you can read more about my approach to dealing with brain fog um, and which has some a part in it about these uh, mast cells and the histamines that I was just talking with you about. So I'm gonna do a quick screen share here. Okay, so um, to so as many of you know, this is my Lyme, my Lyme disease information site, a treat line by Marty Ross, MD. Um, and it, I just wanna point out a few things. So first of all, if you're ever looking for my, my Lyme disease treatment guidelines, all the steps I think you need to do to address Lyme, take a look at my treatment protocol. Um, earlier this week, I posted a new article about how do you deal with the tick bite? Because uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy around that. So I gave you my take on it there. Uh, that tab you look at for the webinars, this is where you look at my book. And here, this tab right here, this big tab, this is the meat and potatoes of this website. Through here, you can find about any article I've ever written about Lyme disease, okay? All right, so in terms of the article on brain fog, you're gonna find that under brain and nerves. And it's this article right here. And in here, I talk about the different things you can do to correct or what brain fog is and what you can do to correct it, okay? And one of those items is lowering histamines, okay? All right. Let me go back here. All right. Good luck to you, Brenda. Thanks for the question. Hello, Tim. Let's see, I have Lyme and had treatment two years ago. My doctor suspects that it has not completely gone away. He now would like to start me on disulfiram for my current symptoms, which are I'm not sure which I mean, that word doesn't make sense to me. Um, anxiety, fatigue, something, and then anxiety and fatigue. Could you please let me know what your thoughts are on this prescription for these uh, symptoms? So um, disulfiram is a uh, medicine that traditionally has been used to treat alcoholics. Um, and it's used for alcoholism because it is known to uh, prevent uh, the breakdown of an alcohol byproduct, which is called acetaldehyde. And if acetaldehyde builds up because it can't be broken down, people get severely sick. They get bad headaches, they can get um, nausea, they can get severe abdominal pain, okay? So alcoholics take it on a regular basis because they know that if they drink, they're gonna get really sick, okay? That's, that's what the purpose is of that drug. Um, about um, three years ago, about two years ago now, um, there was research done out of a lab in Stanford University um, where the researchers were looking at what could they give to treat a form, a of a, a, one of the growth forms of Lyme, which is called a persister form of the germ. 
So you can kind of, to talk about persisters quickly, you can kind of think of there are growing forms of germs and then there are non-growing forms of the germs, okay? or you can call those hibernating forms of the germs. And we discovered about four years ago that Lyme not only has growing forms, but it has hibernating forms, all right? And so uh, what I saw from, what the lab was trying to do is they're trying to figure out, well, what do we give for persisters? Um, this idea of, of treating persister Lyme is a new concept in the last four years. And we, we are just starting to get some um, in information out of laboratory experiments, not human experiments, but laboratory experiments that give us some clues of what might work. And what they were doing in that lab in um, Stanford University is they basically were taking about any kind of uh, medicine that had been authorized to be used as a prescription by the Food and Drug Administration, whether it was an antidepressant medicine, whether it was an antibiotic, whether it was an alcoholism drug, and it was taking those medicines and seeing could they stop the growth or could they um, kill, not stop the growth, but kill these persister hibernating forms of the germ. And they discovered um, that this disulfiram could do it. What was interesting in reading that article is they had a number of other things they researched and most of the article was written about those other things and kind of like as an afterthought, they have this added little paragraph in there about disulfiram. <laughs> And the reason I, that I find it interesting is actually disulfiram has become one of the biggest game changers in the treatment of Lyme disease, actually. Um, and so what happened is a couple of years ago, or about around that time, um, a patient heard about this and went to a colleague of mine, Dr. Ken Ligner out of New York State and said, put me on it. So Dr. Ligner did that and he put a couple other patients on it and he published his findings, what he saw happen with those three patients. And that came out in an article just over a year ago in May, a little over a year ago. And then there he reported that he was able to get one of those patients into remission and the other two had good improvements. So that got a lot of us thinking about using disulfiram. So I use disulfiram in my practice and I use it to treat uh, patients that um, have Lyme that are not recovering. Um, so I will usually, for most of my patients with Lyme, my initial treatment is to put them on standard antibiotics that treat growing forms of the germ. But if we're getting like about six months, nine months into treatment and we're not making any headway, then I'm starting to add disulfiram. Or if I've got somebody that's been treated for years with antibiotics and they still have ongoing symptoms and that kind of a situation, I will try disulfiram too. Um, you're kind of in that kind of ballpark, okay? So disulfiram um, can help treat persister Lyme and persister Lyme could be giving you the type of symptoms that you have. Now, let me just do a, a quick discussion of how well does it work. So um, based, um, my experience says that about using disulfiram, I can get about 20 to 30% of people into remission. Maybe I'm knocking it all out, I don't know, but I'm, I'm getting them well, okay? Um, there's about 20 to 25% of people that cannot tolerate the medicine because of side effects and they have to stop taking it. And then there's this remaining group of people that get better, but they're not getting all the way well. Okay. We think that the disulfiram works two ways. One is it, it can kill um, these persister forms. The second thing that it does is it has a chemical structure in it that involves something called a disulfide bond. And that disulfide bond can be quite powerful at breaking apart biofilms, which are slime layers where germs can hide. So one of the other things it may be doing, in addition to killing these persister forms of the germ, is it may be exposing germs that have been hiding under biofilm to the immune system, and the immune system is stepping in and getting rid of them too, okay? Now, I will give you an interesting side here. Um, I have had a, one patient that wanted to be treated that had never been treated for Lyme before. She had Lyme for 20 years, never had taken an antibiotic at all in her life. And even though we have no proof that disulfiram can treat growing forms of the germ, all that she wanted to be put on was the disulfiram. So we did that. I didn't put her on any other antibiotics. And we're about six months into her, well, about nine months, in, eight to nine months into her treatment now. She's um, about 90, 95% better. So I, I treated her, didn't even do anything about growing Lyme, which has me wondering, does disulfiram also treat growing forms of the germ, okay? And the trouble is I don't have any laboratory experiments to guide me on that, all right? Okay, so when you do disulfiram, you have to start at a very low dose. I usually start people at about 62.5 milligrams every third day. And we gradually build up until we hit a target dose. And that target dose is basically four to five milligrams per kilogram, okay? 
and um, and you want to get up to that each day. So for like a 150 pound person, that's going to wind up being about 250 milligrams a day. Okay, it can take you about two about two to four months to work up to your dose because if you um, it can cause some pretty severe um, Herxheimer reactions. So we have to go slow to build you up. Okay. Once you reach that top dose, then we try to keep you there for about three to four months. Um, and we seem to get the best effect by doing it and then we stop the medicine. So it kind of becomes about an eight month to nine month treatment in most people that we, that we do it with. Okay, so it takes time, all right? And in my practice, I'm using it a number of ways. I'm using it on people that have failed treatment. I'm using it in one person as the only treatment I use. And there's some patients I'm using it to target just persister forms and biofilms. And then I'm treating their growing forms of Lyme by using things like a doxycycline or a cefuroxime or amoxicillin or zithromax or clarithromycin. I'm using other agents to go after the growing forms of the germ, for instance, okay? Now, there are side effect problems um, about the reason people have to stop generally is either they're going to develop um, psychiatric problems that can be bad depression, anxiety, maybe even hallucinations. That happens about 15% of the time. Or um, sometimes disulfiram can lead to neuropathy. Um, so nerve injury, giving you numbness, tingling, nerve pain, burning kind of nerve pains, for instance, okay? Um, generally, both the psychiatric and neurologic side effects should go away once you stop the medicine. I have had the experience where the neuropathy did not go away in one patient. And so I'm still waiting to see if that patient will recover, but some of that neuropathy may be more of a permanent problem. The other thing with disulfiram that we have to be careful about is when we use it, um, we have to uh, watch the kind of foods that you eat and things you put on your skin and in your mouth. Okay, remember, disulfiram uh, blocks uh, the, the breakdown of one of alcohol's byproducts called acetylaldehyde, okay? And you get sick if you have alcohol. So first of all, you can't have any alcohol. And that means, um, that means even alcohol and food, for instance, okay? Um, second thing, you don't have anything that has alcohol that goes on your skin because alcohol can get absorbed through the skin. A third thing um, that you want to do is avoid vinegars and things that vinegar are in. So you got to look at your condiments, like mustard, for instance, has a uh, vinegar in it, okay? The other thing you want to do is avoid fermented foods, and those would be things like uh, kombucha, um, uh, sauerkraut, um, those kinds of, of foods. You want to you avoid those because those produce alcohol as well too, okay? So, you know, I just, that's a long discussion, but that's what we know about disulfiram, okay? Now, so we wondered in the early days, could disulfiram also treat persister forms of other germs? And so some of my colleagues were wondering, could it work for Bartonella? And the, the truth is we now have new research that came out uh, earlier this year, I think it was in Mar April it got published, some studies done out of Johns Hopkins University that suggest in the laboratory that disulfiram is not a good medicine to treat growing or uh, persister forms of Bartonella. So probably when we're dealing with Bartonella, we got to handle persister Bartonella in an entirely different way, okay? Disulfiram does, though, seem to have some ability to help with Babesia. Um, it can help treat growing forms of Babesia, all right? All right, so that's what I got for you. Um, I, I think, you know, just what you briefly wrote here, I think it might be something worth um, giving a try. Um, and um, um, good luck to you. All right, thanks for your question, Tim. Let's see here. Hello, Lauren. Let's see. Hi. Thank you, as always, for your dedication to helping us and the kindness uh, that you show. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Let's see. I have read of some concerns about Lyme patients having general anesthesia. The gastrointestinal doctor I have been referred to will not perform a colonoscopy with general anesthesia versus twilight. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? So. What we know is that people that, um, what I have seen in my practice, and most of this is what we observe, there are no studies that confirm this, but many Lyme doctors, including myself, report that when patients have general anesthesia, and by general anesthesia, 
I mean they put a breathing tube down your throat and you breathe in anesthetic gas, okay? That's what I mean by general anesthesia. If you have general anesthesia for some reason, there's a large number of patients with Lyme that their Lyme disease will get worse. It's temporary, it's usually like a month or two or so, but I just wanna let you know, that's what we see, okay? So I tend to see that in people that get abdominal surgeries, for instance, have gallbladder removed and they have to sedate them, um, anything that might require general anesthetics. Now, what I'm surprised by is generally colonoscopy is not performed with general anesthesia. It's usually done with IV sedation using um, different medicines to make you very sleepy. So I would question if your doctor is really planning general anesthesia, you might wanna look for another GI doctor that would do it the way that most GI doctors do. And that is that they would use um, IV um, sedation for that, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Lauren. And thanks for that question. Hello, Tammy. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I watched your video and read your information about leaky gut. My 16-year-old son scored 83 on your yeast questionnaire. We also did GI map stool testing for him. Candida or parasites didn't show up in his sample. However, strep, staph, and uh, norovirus did. Can these also cause leaky gut? How do you clear these three infections, and do you need to clear them before healing the gut? He is currently on 30 billion strain of probiotic and 5 billion strain of Saccharomyces and has been for at least two years and also three nice stat and two times daily for about a year. Okay. So um, what leaky gut is everyone um, just briefly. And so I have a whole article on about leaky gut and that's what um, Tammy is referring to. So basically what happens in the intestines, you have the lining of the intestines, you have one layer of cells and then you have all your blood vessels here. Separating the blood vessels and the cells is your immune system. It's about 70% of the immune system, okay? And normal functioning intestines, these cells touch up against each other very tightly and there are no gaps, okay? And the way that things get into your blood and go through all these immune cells is they get micro-digested by healthy bacteria that line your intestines and enzymes from um, the pancreas and acid from the stomach. It all gets micro-digested into amino acids and into sugar particles and into fat, small pieces of fat that are not recognized as coming from the original source of the food, okay? All right, so the fats from corn can't be distinguished as being come from corn, for instance, all right? Or the carbohydrates from corn cannot be distinguished as being corn, all right? So anyhow, that's what happens in normal functioning intestines. Everything has to be absorbed through here, all right? And this barrier with these tight gap, no gaps and the, these small cells keeps toxins out, keeps bacteria out, keeps parasites out of getting into your butt, all right? Now, if these cells get assaulted by infection, like parasites and yeast, or they get assaulted by toxins, um, these cells are gonna plump up and pull apart, creating gaps, all right? And those gaps then allow partially digested corn and partially digested wheat and all kinds of toxins to get through and they pass through 60 to 70% of the immune system, get what they do, they inflame the immune system, all right? Okay, so often when somebody has leaky gut, one of the signs that they have leaky gut is they're gonna start having a lot of food sensitivities, okay? So my question to you, Tammy, is does your son have leaky gut? Does he have a lot of food sensitivities? Um, if he doesn't, just finding those infections that you're describing there does not necessarily mean that he has leaky gut. So what I would wanna know is does he have any symptoms suggesting leaky gut? And the main symptom that would suggest leaky gut is developing a lot of food sensitivities and food allergies, okay? Now, there is a type of testing that we can do in these, um, and I did not explain it in the article, but let me talk about it here in a minute. So these, um, these cells are supposed to touch up really tight. There's some proteins in here called zonulin. And when these things open up big, the zonulin um, gets exposed to the immune system and also starts being released. So you can do a zonulin antibody test, or you can actually measure blood levels of zonulin. And if either one of those is elevated, that can be a sign that you have leaky gut. So that's a way to test for it. 
The reason I didn't mention that in my article is it's a very inexact test. Um, it's not, it's still very experimental. It may miss a lot of times when you have leaky gut. The only real way I have found to know if somebody that I trust about whether somebody has leaky gut is if they've developed a lot of food allergies, either they eat something and they react a lot, um, or that they um, have a, f a food allergy testing that shows a lot of um, elevations of, of antibodies against various foods, okay? Um, so first thing I would say to you is, you need to, I, I, you're not telling me here, but I would wanna make sure that you have some evidence that he has leaky gut. That can either be, you know that he reacts to a lot of different foods, or it can be that you've had food allergy testing, or somebody along the way might have done this azonulin testing either for antibodies for zonulin or to see if you have elevated zonulin levels in the blood, all right? If, if you do not have any evidence of leaky gut, then the strep, staph, and norovirus that your testing showed um, probably is not causing leaky gut, okay? That would just be one thought. And then in terms of the norovirus, um, there's not a, and in terms of the strep and the staph, the, the ways that I would combat those is basically being on high doses of probiotics and by being on uh, food rich in soluble fiber that supports good healthy bacteria that line the intestine. So being on Sacro B is one way I would do that. I would do two to four pills one time a day. Um, I would also be on um, probably uh, both a human form of bacteria probiotic, and that would be some, I like using something called HMF Forte. And I might also add to that a third type of probiotic, which is a soil-based probiotic, a spore-forming probiotic. And for that, I like using something called Corbiotic. That would be my approach to treating, to treating this bacterial imbalance. There really isn't any antimicrobials that I would use in this type of a situation. Now, that doesn't mean other doctors might handle it a different way, but that's about how I would go about it, okay? All right, thanks for the question, Tammy, and good luck. Ah, let me just do a quick screen share here. All right, so um, if you're looking for that article that I was just talking with you about, Let's see here, let's go back here. I just wanna see if it's still showing up on my one of my latest articles. No. All right, so um, take a look to find that article. If you're ever wondering what's some of the latest stuff I wrote, come here and then go right over to this latest tab, click on it, and here you're gonna see my article about leaky gut syndrome and the various things I recommend to treat it, okay? Hello, Tracy. Let's say hi, Dr. Ross. I had elevated lead on a challenge test. My symptoms are muscle pain and dysfunction, nerve pain, brain fog, and low energy. How would you differentiate between Lyme, um, between Lyme, BART, and lead? Also, how can I figure out if I'm having low levels of exposure to something over time, like possibly from many supplements I take? All right, so first of all, so, um, let me just look at your symptoms here again. Muscle pain and dysfunction, nerve pain, brain fog, and low energy. So those symptoms could be due to Lyme, could be due to Bartonella, and could be due to lead toxicity. <laughs> so I understand what your question is, okay? What I can reflect to you is in my practice, what I have found over time, when somebody has um, Lyme and Bartonella and lead, the thing, what I like to do is to try to treat the things that I know have the greatest likelihood of making a difference, okay, all right? And what I have found in my practice is that met heavy metal toxicity, when we treat it, tends to have limited improvements that it gives to people. And that even though people may have elevated lead or mercury, that when it comes to those elevations actually leading to major medical problems, in most people, they do not, okay? That's just my observation, all right? So my approach when I have somebody that has Lyme and Bartonella and lead is to treat the Lyme and Bartonella first um, by, by doing things to remove those germs, by killing those germs, okay? And also correcting all the imbalances created by having those infections. And those are the things that I describe in the Ross Lyme su support protocol. So I work on 
getting people sleep because that lowers inflammation, improves immune system function. I work on um, um, having them on a um, low inflammatory diet, like a paleo type diet or on something called an elimination diet. Um, I will try to support their adrenals and their thyroid by having them take a, um, something called ashwagandha because that corrects the hormonal imbalances that you can get in Lyme disease. I have them take things to deal with the inflammation, cytokines, um, using curcumin, for instance, is something I like to use for that. I'll have them support detox by getting them on something called glutathione. Um, I'll remove yeast and then I'll treat Lyme and the major co-infections, okay? That's my first approach. Now, if I get like six to nine months into treatment and somebody has elevated lead, it's at that point, if my patients are not improving well enough, then at that point, I might start thinking about doing chelation. But again, it's, I gotta tell you, my, I have really been disappointed in my practice seeing the benefits that people get from actually chelating is quite small. Um, I just, I've not been that impressed with it as something that helps move the needle forward for or the football forward or the, the needle in a, in a positive direction for people that have these illnesses, okay? All right, uh, thanks for that question. Oh, let's see, you asked another question. Um, yeah, there's, I, I don't have a good answer for you about how do you figure out have you been getting exposure uh, through the supplements. The chances are probably quite small that you'll be getting them that way. The greater likelihood of where we get lead, uh, depending on what your age is, is um, um, it, you know up through I think the 70s or 80s, we used to have lead in our fuel, okay? Um, also lead is found in old paints and old homes. Um, and, and then lead can be found in water pipes in, when the homes used to be plumbed with lead, okay? Those are your greatest sources of lead exposure. So it could even be old exposures that have built up in you um, over time, okay? All right, thanks for that question. Hello, Lauren. Let's see. Hi. Thank you, as always, for your dedication to helping us. And I kind of, oh, let's see. I think I, I you already answered that. I, I'm, I already answered that earlier. It looks like I wrote it twice. Let me go ahead and remove that here. Hello, Elizabeth. Let's see. Hi, Marty. Do you know if disulfiram eradicates Bartonella? Also, do you have an opinion on um, azlocellin? Uh, thanks so much for everything, Elizabeth. Um, you're welcome. All right, so I answered that disulfiram question earlier, but I'll say it again. Um, um, I have not found it beneficial clinically in my practice. And then we have a research that got published. Um, I think the article, this one I'm referring to, was published in May, April or May of this year. Um, it's a study done out of Johns Hopkins University looking at various agents that could treat uh, Bartonella, both growing and persister forms. And to be honest with you, disulfiram did poorly in those experiments. And also clinically, I just don't see it have any benefit at all. So I, I don't think it does anything for a Bartonella. Um, azlocillin is a penicillin. And remember, I was referring to that lab at Stanford University. A doctor, it's a lab run by Dr. Rahadis. Um, Dr. Rahadis's lab um, has done some experiments showing that azlocillin, which is a type of penicillin, um, can treat both growing and persister forms of Lyme. And I believe they've even done um, mouse studies looking at that and found good benefit, okay? There have been no human studies done though looking at it yet. So this is something that could treat persisters and maybe growing forms of the germ. Laboratory experiments look um, look promising, however, we don't have human experiments, okay? And and um, and then there's a there's a wrinkle in this one. Azlocillin, although it is a, a drug that has already been previously approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration here in the States, uh, as an antibiotic, um, it had no one manufactures it right now. And so Dr. Rahadis, I believe, is trying to put together a manufacturing system I believe he's setting up a company to do that or getting investors to do it, um, but he's looking at how can he start getting that manufactured um, so that it might be available. Um, do I think it could work? Possibly. I will share with you a side note. Um, so for instance, um, I think about two or three years ago, 
um, Dr. Ying Zhang and his research group out of Hopkins. They're the ones that published those recent Bartonella studies. His lab has been doing uh, experiments looking at ways that we can treat persister Lyme and persister Bartonella. And his lab's out of John Hopkins University. And they came a few years ago, they came up with a study that showed that the drugs um, daptomycin, doxycycline, and ceftriaxone used in combination in a laboratory could eradicate uh, persister Lyme. And then they did mouse studies that showed great benefit at getting rid of persisters and I believe growing forms of the germ. But when we started using it in humans, we found it had no great benefit, okay? So even though Dr. Rahadas has got some great experiments showing that from a lab standpoint and in mice, it does good stuff, we really don't know whether this is gonna be a game changer once we can get our hands on it and start using it. Um, we're just gonna have to see, okay? All right, thanks for that uh, question, Elizabeth, and, uh, and good luck to you. Hello, Tracy. Also, can I take biocidin with probiotics so we'll kill them? Um, I, so biocidin, everyone, is a, a manufactured by a company called Biobotanical Research. It's a supplement. And it has a, a variety of herbs in it, including garlic, some oregano oil. Um, I believe it's got some cat's claw in it. But it's got a variety of different herbs in it that are shown in the laboratory to do a good job of killing Lyme getting rid of biofilms and preventing antibiotic resistance um, in, uh, in cells infected with Lyme too, okay? The, the laboratory, laboratory experiments show that. We don't have human experiments about it. Um, so it's an antibiotic, all right? So I would not take it directly with a probiotic because antibiotics can kill the bacteria in a probiotic, all right? So I'd recommend not doing it that way. Hello, Tammy, let's see. Is it common to have elevated glucose levels with Babesia or Bartonella? Uh, no, it is not common. Um, uh, now, um, so if it's happening, you should be evaluated for, if, if it would, I would have, I would, if you were my patient, I would start thinking about looking for diabetes or glucose intolerance and uh, taking steps to both diagnose that with blood testing and then the second thing I would do is if you do have it, I would start working with some herbal medicines um, and lifestyle changes to help your body deal with the, the sugar better, okay? Now, having said that, I will let you know that diabetes leads to inflammation and um, Bartonella and Babesia lead to inflammation, uh, but I, um, so that having diabetes can lead to more inflammation in your body on top of what you get from Lyme and co-infections, okay? All right, uh, thanks for our question, Tammy, good luck. Hello, Eileen. Let's see here. Thanks, Dr. Ross, for all your work and these webinars. You're welcome. Let's see. I am currently following your protocols for BART, both current and yeast, for several months now, started with yeast and added BART herbals. I think I'm getting better with less pain, but having weird dizziness. Mine is usually as if I first lie down in bed at night. It's very strong, but only lasts for a few minutes. The last few nights, the dizziness has also been waking me up during the night. Is this un is this usual? Thanks again for your help. So, Eileen, for the, I'm glad to hear you're getting some benefit. Um, uh, and uh, the herbs, everyone, that I recommend for Bartonella are Siddha Akuta and Hutania. I got the idea to use those from uh, Buner, as in Buner Herbs. Many of you may be familiar with that herbalist in some of his recommendations. And I find they can be useful against Bartonella about 70 to 75% of the time, which is great if you're in that 70 to 75% group, okay? By comparison, I find prescription antibiotic regimens work about 80 to 85% of the time. Um, but you know, that's pretty, the herbs are pretty close to what the possible effectiveness is of the prescription antibiotics, all right? All right. All right, so in terms of the dizziness, that is not, that kind of dizziness is not a common side effect of this. And the fact that this, the dizziness that you're having is happening on motion, it's the motion of laying down or the position of your head. Um, and maybe even when you're sleeping, if you're moving your head, you may be creating different positional changes. 
it makes me wonder if you're having a type of dizziness, which is known as benign positional vertigo. And it's benign. <laughs> That's why it's called benign positional vertigo. And it's positional, depends on where you have your head. Um, it's, there's a type of, there's a part of your inner ear uh, called the cochlea that has an apparatus in it that has some crystals and hair cells. And depending on how those crystals land on the hair cells can determine whether you're feeling dizzy or not. And sometimes that apparatus malfunctions. And so there's a way that we can get those crystals to operate correctly and the hair cells to operate correctly by doing some maneuvering of your head. It's a technique called an Epley maneuver. But first of all, I would probably with that kind of dizziness, you might want to look, um, talk with an ear, nose and throat doctor to do an evaluation on you. Uh, and then if they think it is the benign positional vertigo, then they can arrange a type the, to do the maneuver either themselves or get a, a physical therapist to actually do that type of treatment for you too. Okay, that's what it sounds like to me. But if, if I were seeing and you kept having a lot of problems with this, I'd probably refer you to an ear, nose and throat doctor to have them take a look at you. Okay, all right, um, good luck to you. Uh, the, so that maneuver is called the Epley maneuver, E-P-L-E-Y, okay? Hello, Velda. Let's see, does taking coenzyme 10 decrease the success of Mepron treatment for Babesia. Author Dr. Horowitz mentioned this in his book. So I think we, oh, coenzyme, uh, so it's coenzyme Q10. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I should have caught that. It's, so it's coenzyme Q10, which is uh, an antioxidant um, that can be used to support uh, mitochondria function, your energy factories in your cells. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to mix, miss it, mix it with uh, the drug Atobiquone. Mepron is all atobiquone, and, and we use Mepron to treat Babesia. And then there's another drug that has the atobiquone in it called Malarone. Um, and so if you're either on Mepron or on atobiquone, you do not want to take anything that has coenzyme Q10 in it. So that means coenzyme Q10, um, but also other products that have CoQ10 in them, like multivitamins sometimes do. And also um, if you're doing some things to support your mitochondria, uh, the mitochondria support products called um, ATP Fuel and ATP 360 manufactured by Research Nutritionals have CoQ10 in them. So you got to read your labels to make sure. It Basically, the CoQ10 makes it so the etobicone doesn't work. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, uh, good luck to you. Hello, Margaret. Let's see. Could you give us some highlights from the iLads conference? <laughs> well, it's the first day um, and I have uh, three more days. Um, so this there was two tracks that I could have done today. Um, one was um, uh, a track on how do you treat Lyme diseases for new people that are new to this. It kind of leads them through how do you approach it. And then the second track was for uh, current topics and experimental topics. Um, and some of that dealt with COVID-19 um, and some of it dealt with new ways to treat Bartonella, which I've already written about, the new ways that were presented, ways that I had written an article earlier about. To be honest, I'm not really learning many new things. Um, I'm kind of, it's helping to reinforce some ideas that I have um, and some of the ideas I may write about here in the future, but there, there isn't anything specific I want to discuss at this point today, okay? All right, uh, thanks for that question, Margaret. Hello, Christine. Let's see, arterial angioma is related to Lyme and or the co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella. So cherry angiomas are these red spots that you get um, on your skin and they're like almost under the surface. You can see these little red blood blisters and this are little red blood spots, okay? They can occur in both Babesia and they can occur in Bartonella. Uh, both of those can give it uh, to a person. Um, it's not caused by the Lyme germ itself though, okay? Uh, thanks for the question, Christine. Uh, 
Hello, Mark. It's hello, Dr. Ross. I have a friend who doesn't have an official Lyme diagnosis yet, just a few markers on the Western blot, and also has not tested him for mold. Since mold and Lyme have the exact symptoms correct, can you tell me why testing for mold, Lyme, MTHFR, and sensitivity is not standard for all patients? I would have saved my wife years of suffering if I had been done at once and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you. So first of all, so there's um, when somebody has Lyme disease, the reason they ultimately feel badly is that the immune system in trying to deal with the infection, white blood cells manufacture a group of chemicals called cytokines. Okay, And cytokines are good and bad. On the good side, they uh, turn the immune system on. But on the bad side, if they're made in excess, if the immune system is working harder and harder because it can't deal with it, it makes cytokines in excess. And those cytokines make you hurt all over, give you fatigue, make it so you can't think, um, make your nerves not work correctly, give you mood disorders, uh, cause your hormones to dysfunction. So what we call Lyme symptoms are really too many cytokine symptoms, okay? Now, other things that can trigger too many cytokines include our yeast overgrowth in the intestines can do that. And also having mold toxicity can trigger that as well too, okay? So um, it all depends on which doctor you're seeing, Mark. Uh, so for instance, I always, in my uh, new patient evaluations, I'm considering whether somebody might have Lyme or mold. I don't always test right away for mold because sometimes it's not uh, clear to me that it's there. Uh, but if I have a strong clinical suspicion, it could be there based on the history. In other words, I'll ask a patient, uh, when, when did you get sick? Um, had you just moved into a new house? Um, had you been in that new house? The reason I ask that is sometimes when people move into new surroundings and if those surroundings have mold, that's where they get sick, okay? Even if they don't see the mold. Or I'll ask them, did you have any mold exposures? Uh, do you know of your mold exposures, okay? So um, it's something to always consider. Um, in my uh, practice, I usually would do Lyme testing as well as consider whether I should get mold toxin testing. At times, if a patient is not getting, if I decide not to do mold toxin testing based on the history, but then we're months into treatment and somebody's not budging with their treatment, it's at that point that I often will do mold toxin testing. So I'm either doing it right away or near the beginning if things aren't getting better, okay? In terms of MTHFR, to be honest with you, as a detox problem, it has minor benefits of trying to fix it. I don't test for it. And the reason I don't test for it is um, most people, even if you find it, doing the correction for it doesn't make any difference at all. Okay, I'll just be honest with you about that. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we should be considering whether people have mold toxicity on our differential list of things that could be causing these excess cytokines. Um, in terms of yeast, I'm always screening for yeast and treating for people right away if I think they have too many yeast as well too. Okay, all right. Thanks for that question. So for those of you that um, are not familiar with mold toxin illness, let me just, I'm not going to take time to explain it right now, but let me just do a quick screen share so you can take a look at an article. Take a look at my detoxification chapter here. And in terms of mold and, and how do you test for mold toxin illness and what it is, click on this article right here. Let's see. Hi, Belda. Um, do I currently do telephone consultations? Yeah, I well, I do telephone and I do video. <laughs> um, so let me um, show you how you can look at that and discover if there's something you might want to pursue. I'm going to do a quick screen share here for you, okay? So um, let's see. Well, here. All right. So at my Lyme information site, uh, click on my clinic link up here, and that will bring you to my practice site. This is um, for my medical practice. And then take a look at this page called appointments, and then scroll down here. You have two options to see me. You can do something called full medical service, which means that at some point I need to see you in person. Now it used to be I would require I see you in person first before I prescribe, but right now because of COVID-19, um, I will do the initial visits until the COVID rates go down by not examining you, just doing it through telephone or video. 
This limited consult service is what you want to take a look at. This is a visit I do with no intention that we're ever going to see you in person. And so to find out more about these two visit types, look under either my full medical service here or the limited consult service. Read through everything I have here. I have pricing. I have um, what limitations are there to the visit. And there's forms that you need to fill out too, okay? If you decide that you do want to do this type of a visit, then you just click on the book now button here and you can set up your appointment, okay? All right, uh, thank you for that question, Velda. Good luck to you. Hello, Eileen, hold on here a minute. All right. Hello, Eileen. Let's see. Thanks, Dr. Ross, for all your work and help. You're right. You're welcome. Let's see. My husband and I are both following your protocols for Barton Yeast. I have been using them for quite a while. He is ways behind and has recently started treating Bart. We both have had issues with ears uh, and hearing loss. Frequently, it seems to drain down from the ear and down into the jaws and teeth. Dentists want to pull teeth or root canals. Found these clear eventually as well. Is there something you recommend for this? Hmm. You know, based on what you just said here, I, I don't have a specific recommendation. I I'd probably would need to ask you a bunch more questions to get some clarity on, on what specifically is happening with the ears. But based on what you said here, um, I don't have a specific recommendation. All right. Sorry about that. Right, good luck to both of you. Hello, Nathans. Let's see. Hi, Doc. First time viewer here. I recently ordered the DNA connections line and co-infection test. I was alerted to the fact afterwards that it may not be as accurate as the Igenix test. Has this been your experience? Thoughts on the difference between the two? All right. So um, DNA connections um, has a huge problem. <laughs> I, I don't use them. I, what I would tell you about DNA connections is that they're doing um, the type of test they offer is they're doing looking to see if you have um, uh, genetic material of the Lyme and the co-infections in your urine, and it's a urine test, okay? And they did a great job of marketing their lab to integrative medicine physicians and naturopathic doctors uh, a few years ago, and so there's a lot of people using it. But those practitioners failed to do the homework that they should have done, and, and I'm very critical of this lab. The, the lab has not done any val and validation studies that they're willing to share with um, doctors. Like when I called in and said, can you show me proof of that you've tested your test on known cases of an illness, and have, can, did you validate whether it could find those known to have the illness, and uh, would it not wrongly detect people that don't have the illness, okay? So whenever a lab, um, these independent labs like a DNA Connections or Nigenix develop a test, they should be doing a type of study which is called validation studies. And the, what a validation study does is it says, okay, we got this test, how good is it? Um, and so the way that they do testing for it is they take known samples of, uh, or samples from known cases of the illness that are known to actually have the DNA in the case of DNA Connections or um, antibodies, um, for instance, for other labs, and they're known to be cases from an active person. And then you see, you do a test and you say, how good is my test at detecting these known cases? Okay, that's validation studies. Uh, DNA Connections never did it. They haven't done it. I, I called and talked to them a few years ago and said, show me your validation studies, and they didn't have them. So we don't know if it's accurate. And then what I will share with you clinically is uh, because they did such a great job marketing to the naturopaths who didn't do their homework and call up the lab, I had a lot of people that were coming into my office with these labs uh, because I'm a referral place. And a lot of people come to see me when their treatments have failed and their providers will send them to me or they migrate here on their own. And so a lot of these patients were coming in with testing from their naturopaths mostly naturopaths. I'm not trying to be hard on naturopaths, but it was mostly naturopaths, okay? 
and and they would the testing would say they have Bartonella, and the testing might say they have Babesia. But when I started asking about specific symptoms about those illnesses, they didn't have them. They had no symptoms of those illnesses, even though the DNA connections was saying that they did. So I consider it to be an invalid lab, and they haven't done the work they should have done to prove that their testing is 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 worthwhile or accurate. Okay. All right. In terms of Igenix, um, I think Igenix has done the homework, their labs, they have validation studies on the different tests that they do. And so I consider it to be a more reputable and a more accurate and valid lab than the DNA Connections is. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Nathan. Hello, Amy, where do you get tested for everything in Canada? So uh, you're in a tough position up there. Um, Canada does not, the, the, la the type of testing that is done for Lyme and co-infections in Canada is similar to what is done in a regular laboratory systems here in this country. So in the US, our major lab systems are called LabCorp and called Quest, and they're using test kits for the various infections that are approved by our Food and Drug Administration. And if the FDA approves a test kit, all that they've done is they said it's valid for a company to make and sell to other labs, okay? What we have found, though, is that those tests, those standard FDA-approved labs, just are not that good <laughs> at finding Lyme and co-infections. So most of us rely on independent labs. And so, for instance, I work a lot with Igenix. They've done a good job of developing better ways of testing for these infections, okay? Um, there is not an equivalent independent lab up in Canada called Igenix. However, however, you can get Igenix to send you test kits and you can work with their panels. You just got to mail it back across the border. And you have to find a physician up there that will sign off on the requisition form. And that's one way you can do it. You can have Igenix send you the box and then you can investigate which test you want to do and then take it to your physician and say, could you order this for me? These are the tests I want see if they'll do it for you. There are a number of physicians up there that are willing to do that. I, I don't actually have the list of them. You might even try to reach out to uh, Can Lyme, Canadian Lyme Disease Association, and see if they could give you a list of doctors they know might be friendly to at least supporting, um, get uh, signing off on the Igenix test form. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Amy. Hello, Mrs. M.E. Let's see. I had Lyme at age 20. Now at 50, it has returned, and I have tremors and positive Lyme blood test. It showed up after I used colloidal silver for a UTI last March. Why did Lyme tremors start after this treatment? You know, I, I don't know why your tremors started right after that treatment. Um, I, it could be maybe the silver was actually toxic, for instance. Um, because silver is a heavy metal and, and heavy metals can be toxic. Um, so maybe it's the silver that puts you over the edge, possibly. Um, why it exactly happened with that infection, I don't know. I, I can't say for sure. I'd have to ask you a lot more questions about what else was going on at around the same time, etc. Okay. All right. I'm sorry to hear about this, too. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Laura. Let's see. Hi. Thanks for your webinars. You're welcome. My daughter's pain specialist uh, in Canada took her off all the meds that her LLMD in the U.S. had put her on for the past three years to treat Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia because the pain doc thought it was all the meds that were causing her brain fog. She has gotten much sicker since coming off the meds. She saw an ID medical doctor and said he couldn't do anything for her. Next week, she sees a neurologist. Any advice on what she could ask the neurologist for what would actually help her? Her worst symptoms are brain fog, severe pain, especially in the neck, severe fatigue, and many, many other symptoms. We still cannot cross into the USA to get her treatment, her prescriptions filled at a U.S. pharmacy because the borders remain closed. Thanks so much. All right. 
So um, you're in a tough spot. There, a neurologist isn't going to give you any decent help here either. It sounds like this is Lyme disease and you need to be treated. And I don't have good ideas for what you can tell the neurologist. I mean, it's the, the specialists in Canada are horrid when it comes to dealing with Lyme disease and the various ramifications of it as well, too. I mean, they're not that good down here either. I mean, we have a bunch of Lyme literate medical doctors here, but um, your Lyme literate medical doctors uh, more easily get their licenses pulled in Canada than we do down here. That to, to say we don't have our challenges with our medical licensing system. As many of you know, I had to stop practice for a year after about a three year fight with my board. I finally had just had it and decided to step aside while I let that fight continue because I found that the, the um, trying to deal with my board, I was starting to change how I was treating patients to accommodate my board instead of doing the right thing for my patients. But thankfully that went away. So even down here, Lyme literate medical doctors do get persecuted by our boards, um, but we tend not to get our licenses pulled quite as easy as they do up in Canada, okay? Some ideas you might wanna think about if your um, Lyme literate medical doctor would be interested they could try to find um, intern uh, in Canada. There are a number of pharmacies that are called international pharmacies where they have physicians that they contract with to rewrite your U.S. physician prescriptions. And then those pharmacies will mail those prescriptions to you. The two that I work with are in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And um, for my Canadian patients, I send my prescriptions there. That physician that those two pharmacies employ then rewrites the prescriptions and those pharmacies mail across Canada. Those two prescription places are a pharmacy in Vancouver called Cripps Pharmacy. And there's another one that I have used in the past. I haven't used them recently, but it's called Mark's Marine, M-A-R-I-N-E, -E, also in uh, Vancouver, okay? So those are some options for you to think about doing, okay? See if you can get your U.S. doctors to send the prescriptions up to Canada to one of those two pharmacies for their physicians to rewrite. They're gonna charge you a markup fee for that, but it's one way of getting the, the prescriptions, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you. Good luck to your daughter. Hello, Pam. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I was diagnosed with Lyme on August 8th, along with um, Babesia microtia on August 13th. Very symptomatic for Babesia anemia, low platelets, enlarged liver enzyme, enlarged spleen inflammation. Have been taking doxycycline two times daily for five weeks, as well as a tovaquone for the last four weeks so far. Also took and completed azithromycin. My Lyme test showed three positive bands, um, IgM and three positive bands on IgG. Do you have an opinion how long I should be on the meds? I have multiple doctors and they are not in agreement. Still have joint pain, fatigue, and shortness of breath with exertion. Blood tests also showed monoclonal proteins present, but no M spike. Could this be monoclonal the result? be Lyme or Babesia in your experience? And lastly, when do you think it would be safe to take a flu shot? Um, so, all right, so let's see, you were diagnosed on a little over a month ago or around a month ago with both of these. So what I don't, under, what I don't know from you and what you wrote here is do you actually remember a tick bite? And if you do remember a tick bite and when it occurred, then I can kind of give you a better idea here, okay? So let's say that you got sick with Babesia and Lyme and it was a result of a tick bite. Generally, um, we're gonna treat, usually it's gonna be about four to six weeks to treat the Lyme if you start on antibiotics um, within a few days to a couple weeks of that tick bite on average, okay? Ultimately though, you treat until the symptoms are gone, okay? That's ultimately, okay? But if you got started on the treatment within about two weeks of your tick bite, usually it's gonna be four to six weeks, all right? If it's later than that, it can take longer. And so a general rule of thumb with Lyme that I have found in my practice is to expect to treat it for at least two months for each month after you had your tick bite. So again, if you happen to know when it was, you can kind of look back and figure out about how long you're going to need to treat. So for instance, if you started treatment two months after your tick bite, you're going to require about four months of treatment until you become asymptomatic and, and are asymptomatic for a while. All right. When it comes to Babesia, 
treatments can be up to about four to five months actually. So, um, and that's regardless of when you start treating for it. It's usually gonna be around four to five months when you have Lyme. Um, having Lyme makes it harder to get over the Babesia. And also having Babesia makes it harder to get over the Lyme, all right? So I hope that gives you some sense of it. In terms of the monoclonal antibody proteins, you know, I haven't done any uh, of that testing in, in an acute infection, so I'm not sure how they respond, actually. I'm, I'm not familiar with that, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Pam. Hello, Justin. Let's see. I've learned that a lot of anxiety disorders can cause physical symptoms similar to Lyme and co-infections, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, aches. How could I identify when symptoms are from chronic Lyme or chronic anxiety? So um, one way you can look at to see if it's from chronic Lyme would be to fill out a detailed questionnaire that examines a broad a range of symptoms of Lyme. Okay. And so I'm talking about uh, Dr. Horowitz has a questionnaire called the MSIDS questionnaire. Just Google Dr. Horowitz MSIDS questionnaire. You'll find it. See how you score. If you score high, then he has a whole scoring system. If you score high enough, that's probably Lyme. Uh, if you score low and have mainly just the anxiety symptoms, then it's probably anxiety. Okay. So that's, that's one way to go ahead about doing it. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Justin. Hello, Rose. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Recent test results show that my AST and ALT levels have shut up in the last three months. AST was 27 and is now 57. Um, ALT was 16 and is... No, <laughs> I don't have my glasses. I have to... Oh, let me just put these on here for a minute. Let's see. ALT was 16 and is now 82. This is since I started taking rifampicin. Um, I also got results of lipid profile that show total cholesterol has increased in the last months from 7.3 to 7.9. Do you think high AST and LT levels are due to introduction of new antibiotic to my protocol? Rifampicin um, had been on doxycycline with azithromycin for the last three months, now on the rifampicin. And two, my doc has suggested adding uh, Silmarin Forte to my protocol to help and also taking 600 milligrams of NAC once a day. Do you think this is the best way to reduce AST and ALT levels, or should I also be adding liposomal glutathione? And number three, could the high AST ALT levels impact at all the increased cholesterol level? Okay, so I'll try to answer all that. Um, so ALT and AST, everyone, are enzymes um, made by the liver, and they go up with liver inflammation. Um, and so, um, uh, and so generally in Lyme, the antibiotics we give you, some of them can lead to liver inflammation. I usually am okay with my patients in terms of the degree of liver inflammation if I can keep it within two times the upper end of normal. So for instance, the AST level that you're reporting of 27 most labs, I think, are going to have a, it depends on the lab, but an AST normally is considered to be normal, maybe up to 30 to 40, depending on the lab, okay? And so two times the upper end of normal would be 60 to 80, for instance. So I'd be okay with it being within two times the upper end of normal on both the ALT and the AST. When it gets over it, then I start thinking about, is my antibiotic really triggering it? And what I can tell you is the rifampicin, rifampin is one of the strongest uh, medicines that triggers, I'm sorry, it's the medicine has the greatest chance of most antibiotics we use of triggering liver inflammation, okay? All right, so when I have some rifampin and the upper end of uh, the, one of the AST or ALT goes over two times the upper end of normal, then I will start doing things to support the liver, which is exactly what your physician is doing. And what my approach to do is actually to raise glutathione. And you can either raise glutathione by taking N-acetylcysteine, which is a building block for your own body to make more glutathione, or you can give glutathione, okay? Um, in terms of what I think is the strongest way to do it, I usually tend to prefer, I have found greater benefit in using the liposomal glutathione, um, but using, 
NAC can also be beneficial as well too. In terms of the um, uh, psilomerum, which is also known as milk thistle, that can help support the liver as well too. But usually in these situations, I find just using a liposomal glutathione is gonna be enough on its own, okay? And could this lead to increased cholesterol levels? It may be involved in it. I would not go after your cholesterol or do anything about cholesterol and take it your liver inflammation down and then recheck again, okay? All right, hope that gives you enough of an explanation there. Um, good luck to you. And you know, the only number that I'm really concerned about here is that your, that um, your ALT is probably higher than most labs report as two times the upper end of normal, okay? All right, good luck. Oh, oh, why do we even worry about elevated liver enzymes? Let me tell you why. So the, the issue is, is if you stay inflamed in the liver for too long, it could lead to scarring of the liver. It's not gonna give you any immediate problems, but if this goes on months over months, it could lead to scarring. And so that's why you wanna try to avoid letting it sit too high, more than two times the upper end of normal for too long, okay? It's not gonna give you an immediate problem. I wanna be clear about that. You have, you have time to respond to this. You're not gonna be in any danger of acute scarring of your liver, okay? All right. Hello, Joyce. Let's see, hi, Dr. Ross. I've had Lyme for 19 years and aside from approximately one month of doxycycline at onset, I followed a holistic lifestyle, healthy eating, exercise, et cetera, until 2016 when my symptoms emerged. Took uh, MC Bab uh, with Baluki and Crypto Plus with Serapeptase pulsing two weeks for approximately two years. Now on Sidacuda, Hutania, Cats, Claw, and Banderol, doing okay on these. However, increased muscle pain getting worse. I drink 64 ounces of water use Thorn Mariva 500, trace minerals, magnesium, and ATP 360 daily. What is your knowledge about Lyme roll and damaging muscles and joints? I would be interested if others experience the same. Also walk three to five miles daily. Thank you. So, um, you know, Lyme and the co-infections can lead to inflammation in the muscles. Um, I've never seen them result in permanent damage to the muscle. We'll talk about your joints here in a minute. When I get somebody with bad muscle pain like this, I am gonna to try to restore magnesium, okay? And the other thing I'm gonna do with muscle pain, if that's not helping, I'm gonna to try to rebuild and repair energy factories in the muscles called mitochondria. You're doing that. Your ATP 360 is rebuilding the mitochondria. Your magnesium is, um, is what I said, because it helps relax the muscles. And the other thing you're doing that's good is you're trying to get the inflammation down with that uh, curcumin, which is the Thorn Mariva 500. Those are all good things that you're doing, okay? Um, in terms of your joints, if your pain happens to be more around the joints, the other thing you may want to add to this is to do some repair work on your cartilage in the joints. So Lyme likes to burrow into tissues to get far out of the way of blood flow. Oxygen in blood kills Lyme, and Lyme is designed to survive, so it moves far away from blood. So it likes to live on muscle coverings, it likes to live on tendons, and it likes to live inside your cartilage. And to get inside the cartilage, it burrows into it by releasing enzymes that can start to break down the cartilage. And then you get bone rubbing on bone instead of cartilage rubbing on cartilage in your joints and you get inflammation, okay? So one of the other things I will add, if it really seems that the pain is coming from the joint in a situation like this, I might add in glucosamine sulfate, which is one of the building blocks for cartilage. And I would take 500 milligrams three times a day. And I'd give it at least a two month trial to see if it's gonna work. It works about 80% of the time, but I give at least a two month trial. If your pain on your muscles has gotten worse, excuse me, as you add treatment in, it could be, as I said, Lyme likes to deposit in areas of poor blood flow, including your muscle coverings and your tendons. And so, if you're getting more pain as you start killing Lyme, it may be that it's killing a pocket of the germs in a sense and causing more local inflammation right at that spot, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Joyce. Hello, Tammy, let's see. Do you know a reputable source that carries Chinese cat's claw? I did not see it in your store and while craft herbs is temporarily closed. Um, no, I don't, I don't know a reputable source for that, sorry.
Hello, Nabil. Let's see. Hi, doctor. Watching from London, UK. Was hoping you could provide some guidance on my Lyme disease diagnosis. So first of all, <laughs> I'm you're awake late in the night here. So I'm impressed to see, especially if you've stayed with us the whole time. So um, yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. It's quite a time differential there. Um, let's see. Okay, so Friday, uh, July 31st, uh, 220 bitten, two tick bites. Sunday, August 2nd, notice bite, notice bites, ticks had fallen off. So that tick was attached at least two days, 48 hours. Okay. Thursday, August 13th, diagnosed with Lyme disease at the ER due to bullseye rash and symptoms. Prescribed 200 milligrams doxycycline for three weeks, and then Friday, September 4, completed doxy, and I have since still been experiencing symptoms and now constant pins and needles in my hands and feet with a buzzing, if that makes sense. Do you have any advice or guidance on what you think of the symptoms I'm having now are, and are there any herbal remedies I could take? While in the doxycycline, I was taking a serving of 840 milligrams of um, Manuka honey and lunch, turmeric, garlic supplements, and apple cider vinegar gummies, Epsom salt baths. Could I continue with these? So in terms of supplements, yes, you can continue these. Um, Nabil, you still need to be treated. Um, so when somebody has a bullseye rash or symptoms of Lyme, at a minimum, they should be treated for four to six weeks with antibiotics. That's at a minimum, okay? And then on top of that, treatment should go at least until you are symptom-free. So you in England, in the UK, you actually have an option to get your doxycycline without having to go through your physician. You have the ability, as I understand, to go to your local chemist. Um, for those of you that don't know, that's what the pharmacy is in um, the UK. Go to your local chemist, um, your local pharmacist, your chemist, and say that you want doxycycline for uh, malaria prevention, okay? Because you can get it without a prescription there. And I would continue taking your doxycycline um, at least uh, for four to six weeks. I go more the six week side, especially with what you have here. And you actually ought to treat until you are symptom free. Okay. So I'm going to show you an article that you can read that I just wrote. I just published this. It's about what do you do for an acute tick bite. And it has these guidelines that I just told you about in there. And it has the science to back it up too. So let me, let me show that to you here. Oh, wait a minute. Got to hit the right the right screen here. All right, so okay, so go I, again in my um, Lyme disease website. I just added this tab. Or, um, I think towards the end of last week. Is what do you do for an acute tit bite? Okay, and in here I talk about what do you do if you have symptoms. Okay which you did, and then how long do you treat? And I outline that right up here, okay? All right, all right, so, and one of the things I say, if there are any remaining symptoms, then treatment should continue with antibiotics until the symptoms are gone. And also here I say, if a person has a bullseye rash or symptoms such as increased temperature, flu-like symptoms, or neurologic symptoms, then they should be treated for a minimum of four to six weeks and reassessed. You need to keep treating. OK, but again, you have an option, as I understand, within your health system, you don't need a physician. You can just go to the pharmacist and tell me you need your doxycycline for malaria prevention. And then you can get on your doxycycline and stay on it without having to have a prescription for it. OK. All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Goldie. How do you go about getting diagnosed? I'm in LA. My friend Davison is in Montreal. Unfortunately, very behind with such condition. They are. We found your article on testing. Is that still what you suggest in terms of getting the Igenix test? Which ones? Urine or blood? It's confusing. She was first diagnosed as being all psychiatric and then finally got diagnosed um, of a functional neurologic disorder, but nothing is improving. We think it really might be Lyme and Bartonella, maybe something else. But she's had a nightmare with the healthcare system. And of course, COVID is compounding things further. Canadians can travel for health. So we're 
wondering as well where she can go. Do you test and treat patients? We can come to Seattle. No one is helping her and it's been since January. Okay, so first of all, I could help her um, and I could even do that long distance if we were to need to until she, until the borders open up, okay? And um, I'll show you again, I showed another person earlier how you go about setting up to see me uh, by telemedicine, but um, there is a way to do that, okay? Secondly though, what I'd probably do is get um, the Igenix testing done first so that we have that in hand. And the testing that I would do for Igenix, I'm gonna give you some test numbers. I would suggest for Lyme that you get the, um, uh, what the test called an immunoblot. Uh, it looks to see if her immune system is making antibodies against um, eight kinds of Lyme terms, okay, all right? And so that Lyme test is test 325 is the Lyme immunoblot IgM and test 335, which is the Lyme immunoblot IgG. That test has the ability to find Lyme if it's in you 95% of the time, okay? That's based on validation studies that Igenix has done, all right? In terms of Bartonella, and I need to change on to my diagnosed Bartonella article to reflect this. More and more, I'm starting to do a newer test from Igenix which is their Bartonella Western blot. It looks to see if you have antibodies against um, the species of Bartonella, and in addition, four types of Bartonella found in that species. And so that test is called, um, is test 351 and test 352, okay? So test 351 and 352. I would suggest that you order the test kit from Igenix, see if you can get her doctors to sign off on that test and get it done. And then if those come back positive, then I'd be able to help out doing a telemedicine visit. Okay, all right. Let me um, show you, do a quick screen share here again. All right, so take a look at my uh, clinic again. Look on the appointments page. And for me to prescribe, she would have to become a full medical service visit. You can read about what that entails right here, okay? And she's gonna need to fill out forms and everything too. Okay, all right. All right, um, good luck to your friend and, and thanks for that question, Goldie. Sharon, hello Sharon, let's see. Do you still feel artemisinin is useful adjunct to treatment of tick-borne diseases? Do you ever use IV artesanate? So I don't use IV artesanate. Um, I do use artemisinin uh, to treat uh, Babesia primarily if um, uh, some of the other ways that I recommend to treat it are not working. So I use it, um, if I got somebody who doesn't wanna do any prescriptions, I'll use it as part of my herbal uh, Babesia treatment protocol, I would use artemisinin coupled with cryptolepis, um, or um, I might use it as a standalone treatment for Babesia if nothing else is working, okay? So let me, I'm going to do a quick screen share here. All right, so in terms of how I use it, um, take a look at my article uh, that I've written about Babesia. You can find it in infection treatment plans. And this is my article called Kills Babesia Brief Guide. And in my, um, I group my treatments along based on their greatest chance of working. So I have things called tier one treatments and I have a tier two treatment. Artemisinin is one of my tier two treatments, okay? Good luck to you, Sharon. Hello, Christine. I see. I, I seem to have muscle wasting mostly with my arms. Adding collagen to my food really helped my hair grow again, which had become limp, thinning, and frizzy. I lost 50% of my hair a year ago. What can I do about my arms that are sagging and losing muscle? I have Lyme and Bartonella. 
So the muscle wasting in Lyme and Bartonella could be for a couple reasons uh, or three reasons. Number one, deconditioning. Um, with Lyme and Bartonella being active, you just may not be as, um, as active as you were before as so the muscles are becoming deconditioned and they atrophy. So that's one, one thing that could be adding to your muscles um, uh, getting smaller. Number two, if you have nerve injury um, or nerve inflammation or the nerves are not working correctly, they may not be giving signals to the muscles to grow. So one of the things that nerve connections do to the muscles is they cause the muscles to work, but they also release chemicals that cause the muscles to grow, all right? So if you have nerve injury, uh, sometimes it, th those muscles will not get the signals from the nerves to keep growing, okay? And then um, the third thing um, that can be happening is you might have developed some mitochondria injury to the muscles. They're not getting enough uh, power and therefore they're not working well enough and they're not growing, all right? So mitochondria are the energy factories that are found in every one of our cells. Um, you can repair those mitochondria in the program that I used to do that. There's two essential parts to it. Number one, you need to take things to repair the covering of the mitochondria. And number two, you need to be on a good antioxidant to repair the mitochondria from the inside. So the, uh, the, what I like to use to repair the covering of the mitochondria, my favorite these days is to use a product made by research nutritionals called ATP 360. It's three pills one time a day. And I would couple that with their liposomal glutathione, which is called TriFortify. And that repairs the mitochondria from the inside. And to do that, I would do, um, um, in terms of doing that, their liposomal glutathione, I would do five milliliters, which is one teaspoon, one time a day, okay? I'll share an article here in a minute with all the ideas of I have about how to repair mitochondria, but those are the two essential things I definitely uh, would wind up doing. The other thing to do is to treat the Lyme and the, and the Bartonella so that her ner your nerves start working correctly to send the correct signals to maintain the muscle mass, okay? All right, so let me show you my mitochondria repair article here. All right, so let's look at muscle. Let's look at, um, I'm gonna put it in my energy chapter here. Or I put it in my energy chapter here. Take a look at this article called How to Fix Mitochondria and Get Energy in Lyme Disease. And I talk about the mitochondria outer membrane being damaged. And there's three things you can use, ATP 360, ATP fuel, or NT factor. Now. ATP fuel and ATP 360 have some coenzyme Q10 in them. If you happen to be on a tovaquone that I mentioned earlier tonight, you do not want to take these. In that case, you would take the NT factor, okay? And then you want to do this glutathione part that I talk about here too, all right? All right. All right, everyone. That's it. <laughs> It's been a good webinar. I've had a good time being back here again. Um, I had the last two weeks off, so it's good to be back with you again. I am here with you again next week. Um, so I hope tomorrow when I send out the email that you'll sign up to join me again. The other thing I'd ask you to do, if you're getting benefit from these, you find benefit in them, please share what I'm doing with others so that they can sign up and participate in the webinars or at least look at the videos when I get those published um, as well, okay? All right, so I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, keep an eye out in your email tomorrow morning. You'll get an email from me saying uh, that the recording is ready to watch and we'll have information on how you find that uh, recording as well too. All right, good night, everyone.